Well, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm uh, G2, and uh, this talk is going to be about uh, fast uh, interpreter startup on uh, Python 3. So, uh, startup time is a concern uh, everywhere. I I've seen native developers uh, worry a lot about uh, making their apps load faster, especially the mobile people. And uh, despite the differences, there are some interesting parallels between how uh, dynamic linking of uh, shared libraries work in uh, Unix and uh, how importing modules uh, work in a bytecode interpreted language like uh, Python. Uh, the first common thread is that they're both uh, relatively slow and uh, expensive. So here's a random slide with a cursus uh, progress bar. And uh, usually when you see a progress bar, it's a mental cue that things are going to take a bit of time. Uh, but uh, with command line apps and uh, REPLs, on the other hand, you, when you type something out, uh, I mean, you, you expect things to be like snappy. And sometimes it takes an eternity to respond, the upper bound for eternity being a couple of seconds. Oh, and uh, I have uh, aliased out uh, the name of the command line tool uh, to avoid naming any specific tools. Uh, this is essentially uh, the names of uh, two most popular version control systems in existence spliced together. Uh, also, one of them happens to be written in uh, Python, uh, albeit uh, Python 2 and not 3. Um, so, yeah, uh, we tried uh, doing some profiling to uh, see what's the bottleneck here. And uh, a lot of things, but uh, one thing which really stood out was uh, about 20% of the startup time uh, was spent on just importing modules. And uh, most of it was uh, spent on uh, disk I.O., essentially just uh, loading uh, PYC files. And uh, also uh, on allocating lots and lots of small objects. CPython, incidentally, has a lot of optimizations in place for uh, making uh, small object allocation really fast and uh, cheap. Uh, but uh, we won't settle for anything but completely free. And uh, I kind of love the sound of the phrase zero cost abstractions. I mean, this is something which was popular among the C++ community at one point. And these days, uh, the Rust community keeps talking a lot about this. So how do we go about uh, solving this problem or uh, maybe making it uh, less of a problem, perhaps? So one possible solution is to uh, just uh, go for the, re uh, the latest, hippest, uh, ahead of time compiled language and uh, rewrite your whole code base in it. Uh, it's a valid approach. I, I've seen uh, quite a lot of uh, projects do this, uh, both open source and uh, closed source. Uh, isn't the easiest thing in the world because uh, uh, it's, the first thing you need to do is like, uh, it's a very sort of a temporal thing. Uh, what's hip today might not be very hip tomorrow. So you probably might want to go to Hacker News and find uh, what the static language of the month or the week is. And uh, you probably have some fun uh, learning the new language. And, uh, and then uh, you actually have to uh, get down to the hard work of actually rewriting uh, your Python code in this new language and uh, dealing with all the uh, missing Python idi idioms or Pythonisms. So uh, here's another contrived example. Uh, so uh, I just have uh, Python uh, with a single line, uh, import sys. Uh, so the question is, uh, how many uh, PYC files need to be loaded uh, for just running import sys? And uh, sys uh, module, incidentally, is a very special module in Python, so special that it's a part of the interpreter core. Uh, and it's implemented in C. So I'd have expected it to take uh, zero or maybe not more than a handful of uh, PYC files. So let's see. Okay, uh, and uh, it spews out a big list. And uh, I'm excluding things uh, starting with underscore frozen uh, because, as we'll see later, it's baked into the binary. Uh, by the way, I should have uh, used a list comprehension here instead of a list constructor with a generator expression. Should have got my slides uh, code reviewed. <laughs> uh, sorry. I uh, don't know how to go about doing that. Let's see. Yeah, so essentially I'm just importing sys and I'm printing sys.modules and excluding uh, anything starting with uh, 
uh, underscore frozen there. Okay, uh, so what's uh, surprising about this is, uh, I mean, it's not very surprising, but I still uh, find it uh, very fascinating uh, to see how much of CPython is actually implemented in Python. Right. Um, so, okay, uh, so let's see how big uh, the list is. And uh, I don't know if you can see it, it's uh, numbers 44. Uh, at least that's the number on a Mac. I think it's a bit smaller on uh, Linux. So uh, the question is, how do we go from uh, loading uh, 44.pyc files to say four PYC files or zero PYC files, if you could do that? And uh, I guess in some ways, uh, native languages also suffer from the same problem. Uh, and uh, I mean, you have uh, a lot of native applications loading uh, hundreds of shared objects and it tends to like slow down uh, their startup. And uh, the traditional approach for solving this in native languages is static linking. Uh, Go is quite famous for this. You just uh, statically link everything together into a big fat binary and uh, you just trade one problem for another. And uh, it's, it's an okay uh, trade-off and sometimes uh, it's a great trade-off. So uh, the question that uh, I wanted to answer here was, uh, is there a way to uh, possibly uh, steal some ideas from static languages uh, to maybe uh, make uh, Python startup faster? So now for the agenda, uh, we're gonna start with uh, an overview of uh, the module loading system. It's gonna be a very short, uh, high-level introduction. Uh, we won't go into the details of uh, how importlib works because it's quite uh, low-level and uh, relatively complex. Uh, also, this talk is going to be about Python 3 and uh, not uh, Python 2. There's some significant uh, differences in uh, how the import machinery works uh, between Python uh, 3 and 2. And uh, needless to say, it's a lot uh, nicer and simpler in Python 3 than it was in Python 2. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, next I'll talk about uh, what we did to improve the startup performance. And uh, uh, spend some time on uh, the prior art uh, from uh, other uh, dynamic language runtimes, and there's a long history of this. And uh, anything you can uh, think of in terms of uh, dynamic language optimizations, the chances are that uh, Lispers have done this uh, decades ago. So, and uh, finally, uh, some future work on uh, how, how we could uh, go about making this better. So. Okay, let's get started then. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, module loading in uh, CPython. I'm gonna be glossing over a lot of details, uh, but uh, for those of you who are interested in the details, uh, I believe uh, the next talk, which is scheduled right after mine in this room, uh, goes into more details of uh, uh, the lower level aspects of loading code objects, and things like that. So Python's an inter interpreted language and it compiles to uh, bytecode which the interpreter runs. There's a, a PYC file uh, for every PY file somewhere in the Dunder PyCache directory. So now the interpreter loop essentially takes a PyCode object and runs it. And uh, so let's uh, look at uh, how we get from uh, .PYC files to PyCode objects in memory. So uh, the PYC uh, file format is by far the simplest uh, file formats ever. Uh, there's just a 12-byte header, and everything else is just a Marshall code object. The header used to be eight bytes in uh, Python 2, if I recollect correctly, and uh, now there's an extra field, so it's 12 bytes. So the simplest working uh, .pyc loader uh, would be just a couple of lines of Python. Uh, you just open the file, uh, skip the first 12 bytes, and hand it off to marshall.load, and you get a code object. Uh, there's a bit more work involved in uh, turning these code objects into module objects. It involves uh, running it and things like that. But uh, fortunately for us, uh, uh, CPython's uh, py import uh, C uh, API functions have us covered. You just have to call one of those functions and it does everything for you. So uh, now let's dig into some details about the uh, Marshall module. So people are usually encouraged to uh, use a high level uh, uh, library like pickle or uh, something else uh, for uh, serializing and unserializing the objects, but Marshall is lower level, faster, unsafe, and that's what PYC files use. And uh, also, it only supports a limited set of types. Uh, it's quite a long list. Uh, let me just read it out. 
booleans, integers, floats, complex, strings, uh, bytes, byte arrays, tuples, lists, sets, frozen sets, dictionaries, and code objects. And also nuns, ellipsis, and stop iteration. Okay. So uh, this is probably the most important uh, point in the whole talk. Uh, marshaled uh, object graphs in uh, .pyc files are made up of a subset of uh, the types which Marshall supports. And this subset is uh, <coughs> uh, completely, uh, um, yeah, uh, so th uh, this uh, subset of objects is uh, immutable. And it's a very uh, tiny subset. So it's just uh, booleans, integers, uh, floats, complex objects, strings, bytes, frozen sets, and code objects. OK, so here's a plan for uh, improving uh, startup performance. Uh, so we want to bake in uh, frequently used modules into the data segment of the compiler binary, uh, compiled uh, Python binary. And uh, this isn't entirely unprecedented. Uh, CPython already does this for uh, two modules from importlib. So uh, parts of importlib are uh, written in uh, Python, and uh, it presents an interesting chicken and egg problem. How do you import parts of importlib before importlib is ready at startup? Uh, so CPython's solution to this uh, problem is uh, something called frozen modules. So they just uh, serialize uh, the PYC files into a, a C array of bytes and uh, bake it into the binary with a header. And uh, at startup, uh, you essentially just uh, pass this byte array uh, to Marshall, and you just uh, get the module back. So you can essentially uh, load these modules without having to import, uh, imp uh, invoke the import lib machinery. Um, OK, so this uh, approach that uh, CPython takes essentially only addresses uh, one part of the problem, which is disk I.O. Uh, but we want things uh, to be absolutely free, as free as it can get. And uh, we don't want to pay the price of creating lots of tiny objects in memory. So uh, we cheat. Uh, we use a sneaky little trick. Uh, there's this uh, neat feature in uh, C99 called designated initializers. Uh, it's a bit like uh, what uh, uh, list or set literals in uh, Python uh, are, except for the fact that uh, we, we are talking about C, which is lower level, and all you have are like arrays, structures, and unions. Uh, incidentally, uh, this is uh, one of the two C features that I know of, which haven't made it to C++ yet, as of C++ 11. I think the other feature is uh, variable length arrays. OK. Uh, so sys.modules is a dictionary uh, which uh, maps from module names to module objects. So we can call a pi import exec code module object, which is a mouthful, uh, on our uh, statically frozen code object pointers in C and put the resulting module into sys.modules. Uh, import lib requires uh, uh, is required to actually look into uh, sys.modules before essentially uh, searching for anything else. And also, importlib adds it every time it successfully uh, imports something uh, into sys.modules. So sys.modules is uh, like a cache for importing. So we cheat by injecting modules directly into sys.modules. It's a bit of a hack. And uh, perhaps there's a cleaner way to do this, uh, but this seems to work for now. And uh, finally, I'm missing a bullet point uh, titled profit. <laughs> OK, uh, so let's uh, look at some uh, benchmarks. Uh, so this is a very simple micro benchmark. Uh, we try to count the number of uh, open and stat calls that uh, the Python binary makes at startup. And uh, you see that uh, the, the number of stat and open calls are reduced by half. Uh, I, I hope the slides are readable. Uh, and uh, so some of you might be wondering, uh, why, hasn't the, uh, why haven't the numbers gone down to zero? And uh, that is because uh, of uh, dynamically linked uh, shared objects, the C equivalent of uh, imports, roughly speaking, which also end up uh, calling uh, open and stat uh, to load their uh, modules. So libpython, libc, any native extensions, and uh, a lot of uh, shared objects loaded also indirectly end up calling uh, OpenStat. 
So you cannot uh, entirely get it down to zero, but uh, we verified that uh, we're not loading any .pyc files. So this is just native stuff. Uh, okay, so here's a very similar uh, benchmark. We, we try benchmarking importing diffLib, uh, which is around 2,000 lines of Python code, and we achieve a nearly uh, two-thirds reduction in the number of uh, stat and uh, open calls. And uh, we chose Diffflip for uh, benchmarking startup because it's a relatively large uh, Python module, which also happens to be a part of the uh, Python standard library. Okay, uh, so in terms of uh, performance, the improvement is uh, rather modest compared to the reduction in the number of uh, open and stat calls. Uh, in this case, it's uh, approximately 21% uh, improvement. And uh, Incidentally, uh, Bench is uh, quite an interesting uh, benchmarking tool. Uh, it can run uh, any uh, command line app uh, until it can find a fixed point for the startup time, uh, sort of like a generic uh, version of Python's uh, time it module. Uh, but this happens to be written in Haskell. And uh, I tried to get it building on my Linux server, but ran out of patience while trying to install Haskell stack. So, uh, which is why these uh, benchmarks were run on a Mac instead. <laughs> um, okay. So, th the same uh, benchmark again with Diffflib, uh, approximately a 22% uh, improvement. So, you, uh, you might notice that uh, we're reducing uh, things by approximately a constant factor in both uh, the number of uh, open and stat calls as well as uh, the startup time. And uh, this pretty much is what's going on here. I mean, we could bake in more modules and get fatter binaries, and uh, so it's a trade-off. Uh, so now we'll look at some uh, ugly uh, generated uh, C code. Uh, okay, I hope it's readable. Yeah, okay, so this is the simplest possible case. Uh, so actually, uh, nuns are simpler, but uh, let's just go with ints for now. Uh, so essentially, uh, we just have static structures uh, with a bunch of macros. Uh, so you, if you can uh, essentially cast this into a pi object, it uh, behaves like a pi object, except for the fact that you can't free it, but that's another thing. Like if you try to free it, you'll get a hard crash. And uh, so uh, the way we prevent uh, freeing these objects is by uh, cheating with a ref count of two instead of uh, one. So uh, it never frees it. Uh, but uh, we, we only do this, uh, I mean, we, uh, this, this sort of cheating is only done on uh, top level objects. So modules, uh, uh, like, uh, so the op inner objects in the module uh, graph actually have accurate ref counts. And uh, incidentally, uh, another optimization that we perform is uh, if we have the same objects uh, which are repeated across uh, multiple modules, uh, we just have a single uh, serialized C instance of it and we increment the ref count and it's shared everywhere. So uh, immutable, uh, uh, immutability uh, wins. And uh, yeah, strings are also known as uh, uh, PyCode objects are a little more complicated. Uh, there are about uh, four different internal representations for Unicode objects in CPython and uh, we had to implement support for serializing all of them. Okay, uh, so tuples are a bit more complicated uh, because uh, they're containers for other objects and uh, this means that uh, uh, there are some interactions between these objects and the garbage collectors. And, uh, and we just tell the garbage collector to not track our objects. I don't think uh, the slides are readable, but uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, so uh, we just say, um, we say, Oh yeah, uh, GC untracked. So we just set the GC untracked flag and we set the previous and the next pointers to null and it just works. Uh, so uh, the tooling uh, I wrote to uh, do all of this uh, was about uh, 800 lines of Python, 700 lines of C code and some 200 lines of tests. Uh, and the patch to CPython was about uh, 100 lines or so. And, uh, and that was it. So I think uh, like once you figure out all the Hairy details, it's incredibly simple to implement. Uh, incidentally, uh, the generated uh, uh, C code for uh, all of this was about uh, 75,000 lines of C, but it's machine generated, so I'm not really that concerned about it. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, there's uh, one thing that I uh, didn't mention, which is uh, we had a minor problem with uh, frozen set objects. So, uh, uh, 
Hashes for strings and bytecodes are randomized at startup to prevent uh, hash chaining attacks. And uh, we can get around this with, uh, for the cached uh, hash field on Unicode objects by setting it to minus one, and the interpreter just uh, populates it on demand. Uh, not so for buckets on uh, set objects. Uh, so the comment you see there, uh, if you can read it, cached uh, hash code of the key uh, is a bit misleading. Setting it to minus one leads to a hard crash uh, while the interpreter does a set lookup. So the workaround was to essentially have a predicate which uh, checks every set in the code to see if uh, hash randomization is applicable to any of its uh, items. Or items within items. Uh, and uh, if that's the case, we just tag it and uh, we do it at runtime. So this is probably the only bit uh, which uh, we do not, uh, which is not zero cost. Uh, but everything else is absolutely free. And uh, <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about prior art. Uh, there's a lot of prior art uh, dating all the way back up to the early 70s. Uh, so Things that we take for granted today, like uh, you know, linkers and loaders and shared objects and things like that. I mean, these things did not exist in the early days of computing. And uh, the only way to go about doing things was to uh, have a little REPL and you just run things and uh, you dump the memory image onto a disk and the next time you come back, you load the memory image again. And uh, so, I mean, there's a lot of uh, image-based languages around. So uh, let's start with the modern times. Uh, V8 has this feature of uh, startup snapshots. JavaScript, uh, despite being uh, syntactically rather different from Python, shares uh, very similar problems when it comes to importing modules. Um, I mean, requiring modules in JavaScript. And uh, this problem is particularly pronounced for uh, the now uh, fashionable trend of writing desktop GUIs in JavaScript with the Electron framework. And uh, Atom, uh, one of these, uh, editors written in JavaScript, uh, uses a V8 uh, API feature called uh, create uh, snapshot data blob to essentially uh, pr create an image, uh, a pre-warmed image with uh, all the required modules preloaded. And uh, that seems to make uh, startup faster for them. So going a little further back, Emacs, uh, which is mostly written in Elisp, again, a dynamic interpreted language, had a very similar uh, a problem, and uh, their solution to it was quite interesting. They implemented an unexec function. Uh, it's one of the more bizarre function names I've uh, come across. It's, uh, it's quite logical, actually. Uh, exec, uh, which we all know, takes an executable file and returns your process. Unexec takes a process and gives you an executable file. <laughs> and uh, I believe this feature has lately been deprecated by the Emacs people because uh, apparently it's a lot of work to support it across all platforms. So, yeah. And uh, finally, yeah, image-based languages. Uh, I think uh, these are the two that I know of. Uh, incidentally, there's also Factor, uh, which is a modern fourth dialect, which uh, also happens to be image-based. And uh, I remember that uh, uh, the function to save uh, images in uh, SPCL uh, is called save lisp and die. <laughs> which is quite interesting. Uh, okay, uh, so future work. Uh, there's, uh, there's probably some things we could do to make things better here. Uh, the first thing is uh, we can remove the need for a C compiler. Uh, there's nothing preventing us from uh, writing a binary image with one or more modules with some headers to perform like traditional rebasing and binding fix-ups, uh, which uh, an operating system's uh, dynamic image loader performs while loading native shared objects. And if you can do this, we don't need a C compiler. And uh, we can do this at runtime. And so we can have something like uh, Python's compile all modules, and you can just get a big fat binary image for your whole uh, Python application, and uh, next time it starts much faster. And I think that'll make it a lot more accessible to uh, everyone else. You don't need to have a C compiler around. And uh, finally, uh, I did mention that uh, injecting modules into sys.modules is a bit of a hack. So I think it makes sense to do it the proper way with uh, custom finders and loaders. Uh, for import lib. It's a bit like uh, zip import in Python, only a lot faster. Uh, so uh, that's it uh, for this talk. Thank you very much, and uh, please feel free to ask me any questions. Okay, any questions, please? Well, I think it's okay. <laughs> 
Hi. Um, I may have missed this at the beginning. I came in a little bit mm -hmm. late. Um, I was wondering what the use case for this is, because uh, you showed um, command line applications, but mm -hmm. typically they're going to run against uh, the system Python install, which typically wouldn't be customized for that application. Um, so is it, is it for faster server startup time? Um, Actually, it, it doesn't matter as much for server startup time because uh, server process are usually long running, right? Yeah, of course. Uh, so now, even if it is a uh, system Python, uh, you have a set of modules which are always uh, imported. And you could shave a couple of tens of milliseconds off of startup time uh, for, for system Python. But obviously, if you're bundling your, uh, so I think uh, something like, uh, say, Py2exe or whatever could probably stand to benefit a lot more from something like this. Mm, hello. Mm, you showed us the syscalls mm -hmm. and the number decre decreased, mm -hmm. but there was the column that said that uh, calls without errors oh, right. were, the, were the same, the same number. So uh, let's just go back to it. Mm -hmm. The previous one. Right. Uh, the previous one. <coughs> even. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, these are errors? Not, uh, uh, aha, okay, this without is the comment from above line. Okay, sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think importlib uh, tries to look for a whole lot of things. And uh, I think uh, we did not lobotomize importlib sufficiently uh, for this uh, ah. test. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, so is this, uh, oh, sorry. So I'll stand up. Uh, so this, your, Py, uh, patched Python, like, mm -hmm. do you want to use it for yourself or you want to push it to upstream at some point? Well, uh, I don't know. I think uh, the upstream doesn't really like a dirty hack like this. Uh, but uh, I suppose we could probably clean it up and uh, I have it as uh, some sort of a third party module where you just import stuff and things. I mean, this is something I mentioned in the future work section, right? So if you can get rid of the dependency on a C compiler, and you could just uh, have something like, say, import startup speed, and it just makes things faster. Yeah. But you're, you're actually using it right now? Uh, no, no, it's just an experiment. Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, OK, I think we don't have times for, time for questions anymore. Uh, let's thank Jidu. Thank you very much. <laughs>